Okay. Um, how many of you guys are actually involved in testing? Just for a show of hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's basically no one, given that we've got a nine, yeah, we've basically got a room full of developers. That's a little bit sad, actually. Right, so, so, you, so then we figure out that you've broken them and then you need to fix them. Is that how it works? Yeah. Okay, anyway, uh, my name's Kat. I work at Collabora where I am the QA lead and I work on QA related projects. Not only testing, that's what I'm actually going to talk to you about today. Things outside of just testing, so more testing management. Uh, if you're expecting me to tell you how to do automated testing, this is not the talk for you. You need to get, come on Monday morning to um, Carlos's GitLab CI workshop. He's going to tell you how to set up all your CI with our new fancy shiny GitLab. Okay, um, so why do you test? This is where I want some input from you guys. Why do you guys do testing? Okay, please use the microphone so we get the recording. Because stuff is always broken, and even when it's not broken, you can't tell if it's if it works well until you test it. Okay, so you're assuming that when stuff's developed, there's going to be broken things, right? Any other reasons we do testing? Over to Brett. Uh, because qualitative feedback is nice, but quantitative, like hard numbers are unarguable and I would say more useful. <laughs> okay. Now it's your turn, Tracy. Because uh, last year, Tracy and I spent a whole day in a room with someone else as well, figuring out why we do testing on the project. Tracy, do <laughs> Okay, people have to actually use whatever you produce, and they're not going to use it if it's broken. And particularly if you're um, doing this for industry or something, you know, it's, it's important. So some of the work we do is for operators who drive the cars or use medical equipment or whatever it is. If it doesn't work, it's actually really important to know if that port monitor failed or broke. That's why you do testing. Make sure it works. Yeah. So basically to make sure stuff works. But, what do you actually consider working? Do you want the thing you produce to be always the same? And do you always want to, for example, be able to build it and once it's built, it's always the same? Because sometimes if you build things under different environments, they'll actually, you might find new bugs. That you, for example, in your environment, if something might build perfectly, but in someone else's environment, it might not. How do you catch that? How do you find that? Do you wait until it fails, or do you try to catch it before it actually fails? Because if you wait until something's failed and, say, a user finds the bug, they're, they're already affected by it. They're already having a bad time. So the, one of the main reasons we do testing is to actually find these bugs before the users hit them. And in the case of the software industry, to find them before the customer gets the deliverable. Checking if something's ready for release, we test it now. To check if it's ready for release, we have to release candidates. Users actually go out and test that. If they find, find bugs, those get fixed. Same for other projects I'm involved with. We have release candidates prior to actually making our final release. Quality? Can someone tell me what quality actually means? Quality means that it's generally like a it meets the expectations and the sort of the desired goals of the project, but it also sort of has like a general like high high usability. Like it's 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 a pleasure it's a pleasure to use to be subjective. Can you quantify that? Um, so, I mean, possibly because you can observe users. You can observe users using meta. Um, data that you collect. So if somebody starts using a product and immediately stops using it, then it's, you know, why are they stopping using it? Maybe it's a bad experience. So how do you keep um, them engaged in the product? And I think the longer they're engaged, you know, usually the higher quality of the experience. So 
you're talking about actually measuring the quality of your stimulus. But what if you want to make sure your product has quality before it goes to the use? How do you make sure that it's a quality product before the consumers, before your customers, before your users actually get it? I mean, I think it's um, a collaboration between the QA team, the design team, and the dev team. You know, so the designers and the dev team are working together to define the product that they're making. And, you know, they have an idea of what they're looking for. And obviously, bugs will happen. And, you know, in addition to, you know, things don't always work the way you expect them once they're implemented. You know, if you implement it according to spec and you realize, oh, that's actually not a very good experience in the end, then you need to sort of evolve that and, Something that I actually find happens quite often is things are implemented to spec, but the experience you get from that is not necessarily the experience the user wants. Yeah, that does happen. Nick, you want to say something? Quality could mean that the defect ratio is underneath the uh, industry standard benchmarks for the amount of code and change that you're doing. That's actually something you can measure. <laughs> That's a way to define quality where you say, this is number of defects which are acceptable, this is not, this is what the industry standard is. And if you're doing better than the average in the industry, then good on you. If you're doing worse, maybe you should try something else. What about confidence in your product? Like when we release GNOME, we want our users to have confidence in GNOME, right? When you're releasing a product in the software industry to actual customers, if it doesn't work, they're not going to buy it again. They're not going to update, they're not going to use it. So you want to make sure it's working before it actually hits the shelves, as it were. So obviously we need to do some testing, right? Yeah, there's a few else. I think more people should be doing testing. Yeah. Okay, so what type of testing do you do on your projects? Um, let's have someone from GNOME. Someone who does GNOME applications or shell, anyone? No application developers here? We've got one at the back. Oh, we've got two at the back, actually. Um, for GNOME games, for example, we are doing some integration tests for some of the libraries we ship in our flat pack. Okay. So you're talking here mostly about automated tests to make sure that your software at least starts up doesn't crash, things like that, right? Yeah. Um, Federico and then Conta. Yeah, pretty much the same. In Libraries VG, we have uh, regression tests to ensure that uh, the library doesn't break, like it keeps rendering the correct results, it catches errors. Uh, it's just a library, so we don't have any type of like end user testing. Okay. That's a good point. Um, some things that we are actually doing, I will speak for elementary, but I think it's the same case for GNOME. Uh, we are basically doing most of the tests uh, by just dog footing or on um, apps, which just covers a lot of cases. So this is actually more what I'm looking for, because when we talk about automated testing, that's just a method of running your tests. It's not actually a type of testing that you're doing, it's just one method of doing it. Um, so something that some of you might have actually had done on your apps is usability testing. The design team and Jim Hall a couple of years ago went and actually did a lot of usability testing, and as a result, redesigned some of our apps. The UI. That actually had a huge impact on um, what our user experience and the feedback we got back from users. Also, what about integration testing? This is something we do on Apparatus, which is the project I'm going to be focusing on here with Relation to Gnome. Uh, I spoke about it, I think, in the last year, year uh, as an introduction, and we had it a couple of years ago where we just had an overview of the project. If you guys are interested in what it is, you can watch the videos from the last two products. Um, integration testing. Does your app actually work with the rest of GNOME how it should? 
does it, for example, connect, uh, use the Wi-Fi properly when you have a connection um, to something? Does it crash if you don't have a Wi-Fi connection? That sort of thing. Because just testing your app in isolation doesn't actually give you that. You need to test it with the rest of the phone, especially for apps which are interconnected. Um, what about regression? If you hit a bug, do you fix that bug and add a way to make sure that you don't reproduce it again? How many of you guys have fixed a bug in the last month or so? Hands up? Yeah, for a few of you. Pretty much all of you who are developers have fixed a bug. After you fixed it, what did you do to make sure it doesn't happen again? I have a pretty extensive regression test suite, so uh, anybody wants any advice on making one of those, I'm happy to share it. What do you, um, which app is it for? Or? GJS, oh. not an app. Yeah. So there you go. You can add regression tests to make sure your users don't get the same bugs again, because you'll be actually checking that you haven't reintroduced those bugs later. This is actually something that seems to be quite common to me, that certain areas of software in your software will be failing more often than other areas. Sometimes it's because they're more complicated to actually code and therefore a little bit more fragile when it comes to making changes or making more changes. So in those areas, you might actually want to think about adding regression tests. What about ad hoc testing? You've already mentioned dog feeding. That's a, a type of ad hoc testing, right? That's true. This is actually how I first got into testing. Uh, Mike and I are part of the GNOME documentation team, and as part of our writing our documentation for all the GNOME apps, for the shell, and everything else in the build, we actually use every single feature. And we retest when we can, because this takes a lot of human effort, every feature at every release. And there are users who will do that as well. So when we make our first release candidates, there are actually users we have who will go and test it for us. And this is not something we do in the film, but for example in Fedora, and I think in Ubuntu as well, they have testing days, pre-release testing days. They literally get their users to install the latest version of Fedora or Ubuntu, which is you know, obviously, and they get those users to just use those versions. Or even sometimes they have lists of things they want users to try. Now, uh, those sorts of things, they're actually a type of test management. I'll get to that in a bit. But the other question I have for you guys, is your testing consistent? Do you always do the same testing prior to every release? Now, you probably do because you do regression testing. What about the rest of you? What about you, Karma? Do you do the same testing prior to every release? No? Random? Have you ever missed something? that you tested it for a previous release, which broke, and then was broken for the next release, and you had to test it in between. So it's human error. You were talking about literally missing something and just not testing it. So what do you want to have if you don't have consistent testing? Anyone? Yeah? Yes. That's what I like to hear. So you want to add reproducibility and you want to add structure. Because then you'll have consistency. And you'll know exactly which bits of your software work. And you'll know exactly which bits you don't know about. So when you talk about adding reproducibility, we're talking about like defining what you're testing. So literally saying, I'm going to be testing this area because it's important, that area because it's also important. Maybe this other one, which is not quite as important, but a lot of users are likely to hit it. Like for example, um, something you always want to test is starting up your app and making sure it doesn't crash, right? 
I actually, at one point, installed a released version of, I think it was Blender, which would crash and start up consistently, every single time. You don't really want to have that, because if a user hits that issue, they're never going to use your app again. I don't use Blender anymore. Actually, that's not true. I gave it to a couple of years and tried it again. But still, that's two years of usage that they lost because the app was crashing and starting. Um, what about automating? Like, we've heard that manual testing is consistent if you do it ad hoc, and you also know that there's human error. What about automating what you can? Yeah, because if it's automated, you're less likely to introduce mistakes, you're less likely to miss something. Sounds like a good idea? And structure? Yeah? So we actually want to know exactly what we're testing, when we're testing it. Do you want to know why we're testing it? Yeah? Ideally? Okay, give me an example, Nick, of something where we want to test it, but we don't actually care about why we're testing it. <laughs> okay, so what do we test? Why do we test? And how do we test it? Anyone wants to give me an example? Something to do with the film in this case. I'm going to pick a random person if no one puts their hand up. Let's go for... Oh, Nick, thank you for volunteering. So, you literally have a manual test case where you open the calendar and you check the number of days. <laughs> because of something that happened a long, long time ago. Do you... I think that's fair. I think that's fair. I think he still owes everyone drinks over that one. Yes, they were off by one. That algorithm was wrong because it did not match any other calendar I had. See, this is a user saying your software was wrong. But that's the thing, We're, you test the things that you can, you test what you care about, and sometimes the user is actually going to have a different opinion. This is where testing becomes more difficult because your application might work the way you want. This is going into design and that sort of thing, so, but which is not what today is about. If you want to talk about design, there's plenty of people who are hacking that too. So, we only have a limited amount of energy and effort, right? I mean, there's 24 hours in a day. How many hours of those can we spend on there? Hands up, someone. Come on. Anyone? What can we do? Without getting murdered by a family. Yeah? So, probably for half an hour. Outside of work, half an hour. In work, your work day, plus half an hour? Maybe? No? Might be a bit tired of working with them at that point. Okay, so we can spend, say, an hour, half an hour, something like that per day on average. Work. No. How long do you think it's going to take us to test all of them? Years? Yeah. There will be murder committed. People will lose their families. Some people might starve because pizza won't turn off in time. I can tell you from my experience with my testing some of our applications, testing the shelf for documentation. This is specifically for IT documentation, so not even testing every feature. Um, just for the shell, I think it takes us about a week, between a team of about four or five people. Yeah. Then on top of that, applications. It's not doable at all. So we automate what we can. 
Uh, the upside of automation is that it's got very low human running costs, usually just to say go and kick it and when it breaks you fix it. Uh, but you're not actually doing the best yourself. It can sometimes have uh, high costs in terms of uh, hardware. You may need a lot of hardware to write a really good automated test suite. Uh, that's actually one of the reasons you might want to reduce your testing to being run, say, once a week rather than every day, or once a day rather than twice a day, just to free up your hardware or and not have to wait, you know, to say, oh, maybe, oh dear, we're going to be late for lunch. Okay, just joking. Um, um, so, yeah, you might want to uh, run your tests periodically rather than continuously, so that, for example, if your test suite takes two days to run, which is quite a bit of time, but in some cases I've actually seen that you're getting the results, say, once a week after it's been run for two days. But then, say, if something fails really early on, like, for example, if it fails to build, if it fails to boot, you've got a really big problem because that can delay your testing. And then already you've got that delay, so you don't know if everything else is working necessarily. But high reproducibility, because there's no human factor involved, Users are good at doing the same thing over and over again without making any mistakes. Humans, on the other hand, make mistakes all the time. You know this, right? That's why we get bugs. If humans didn't make mistakes, we would get no bugs, right? And the stock would be pointless. Yeah? They do, but it's rare that it's negligible. Um, manual testing? You can start testing manually just by installing the application from Git or whatever. Very low setup cost. You can start manually testing something today. Um, but high running cost and you don't have the time. So, I men mentioned manual testing with a little star. That's because most manual testing can actually be automated. Why don't we automate everything? Any ideas? Federico. Yes, it takes a lot of time and effort, and we don't necessarily have the time and effort. For example, something which might take five minutes to test manually could take three or four weeks to automate. What's the point of automating it if you're testing it, say, once every three months, right? So you've got to be reasonable about that and think about the amount of effort you're putting into automating against the amount of effort you're actually putting into testing. There are some tools which can help you with automation, for example, GitLab. I mentioned new shiny GitLab for GNOME. We've also got new shiny GitLab for Apprentice, which we're starting to use now. And that has continuous integration, which is automated. So you can actually run a bunch of your automated tests pre-merge pre when you get the tests. It saves a lot of effort and trouble later because as someone who used a maintainer module, I can say I've had patches sent to me, which broke my build. I was not a happy bunny. I'm sure none of you like patches that break your build. Lava, this is what we use on Apertus to uh, do most of our integration testing. It's a tool made by Lunaro. It's out there. Use it. Why not? It does have some uh, setup costs in that it takes time to set up and you might need to make some changes to your project to make it work. But the tool's available. OpenQA, another really good tool. OpenQA does uh, screenshot capacity, so it actually does some of that manual testing you might be doing as a user, or your user might be doing, um, and it can actually automate it. Uh, OpenSUSE use it for, they actually test, test a lot of them with it. The, the primary reason they have it was because they wanted to use it, I think, for uh, testing boot up, so like the uh, first user process, booting up, no, things like that. Uh, but I think nowadays they also test applications with it. And actually, we could, as known, we could take their test suite and it would be really super easy to actually run it directly on our upstream phone. That's something we should probably do at some point. And there's a few others, but there are not that many good maintained open source tools. There's a lot of proprietary tools, not quite so many open source ones. I'm going to try and actually go through a bit faster because we've only got five minutes left. Uh, so how do you organize your testing? Anyone? Well, we know that you organize it because you get failures and you add regression tests. What about the rest of you? Do you use your years and years of more experience?
And how do you know how likely a user is to see it? How do you get to that? Uh, intuition is actually a large part of testing because we decide what to test based on how we feel. And then we generally look at the bugs coming in, we see where they are, and use that to adjust our testing. Some of us keep our notes in the back of an envelope on our desk, which then gets turned into the trash eventually, or studied by someone who gets pissed off with the stick in the desk. Um, but then there's another problem with that. You have a plus factor of one. If you keep all your testing notes on a bit of envelope, you get run over by a bus. No one else can test your app. No one else can test your operating system, right? So maybe we should organize it a little bit more formally. Maybe we should share our organization with other people. This is where test cases come in. Test cases are basically descriptors of what you are testing. You might already be writing them. You might not be writing them, but chances are you are. Um, but basically, they you need to be able to identify what you're testing, uh, describe what it actually is, instructions which can be followed. These instructions can be followed by a machine or a human, depending on your test case, and tell you what to expect. Now, a failed test case means something doesn't work. A fast test case means it works, right? Now, this isn't to say test cases are foolproof. It can happen that you write the test case, which passes, but the thing still doesn't work because you haven't actually defined what you're testing properly. Or you're testing a slightly wrong thing. Or maybe you're not covering enough of it. So again, that's something you will uh, gain experience with and be able to figure out based on your intuition as well, whether you're actually doing the right thing. There's no point in testing something which doesn't get used. And there is no point necessarily testing every single corner case that exists. Right? Because we only have so much time that that's what we need. I already mentioned um, that there's lots of proprietary tools, but what about being open source tools for te managing test cases and test results? Well, there's Nitrate, which is produced by Red Hat, but it is not very well maintained, and every so often the person who gets paid to work on it drops off for a while. Manually, unfortunately, that's what I've got this experience with. You're gonna well, close your eyes if you don't like horror stories. Okay, so on the practice at the moment, we're managing test cases. <laughs> yes, I see Tracy Heidi in front of her phone. Um, on the wiki, this is horrendous because you don't get proper versioning. Um, you don't necessarily get people updating the test cases as well when something changes. Like for example, there are some test cases which need updating with every release because they're release dependent. So that doesn't always happen, and this is a really, really bad idea, by the way. It's better than nothing, but it's worse than, like, ideal. And test results also on the wiki. There's some problems with that. For a start, we can't track results from release to release. We can't see where we keep getting failures. Because to do the tracking from a wiki, you either have to write some really complicated scripts or do it manually. And that is not fun. So yeah, difficult to keep things up to date. Difficult to track failures between test runs. And I am finishing up, honest. Um, difficult to analyze your failures, where you're failing, why you're failing, whether they keep repeating the same area, whether they're actually even the same things that keep failing, or if it's different things that affect the same area. Uh, because some of your tests might not identify the actual thing that fails, they just might identify the area that it fails in. Uh, and tracking variations, also pretty much impossible. So at the moment we're looking at some solutions. Um, we've decided to actually track our test cases in Git so that we get versioning, we get uh, branch for releases, so that you always know which tests will run for a specific release. And we're going to be storing all our test cases in the same format. Previously, we were duplicating our things in test cases. We had the human readable format and the basically human readable but for the machine format. Uh, so now we're only going to use the one, which is the machine format, and we're going to expand it to make it human readable. Um, and we're going to have a web UI to actually be able to enter manual results and results of that test. 
if you guys are interested in that, maybe next year I'll be able to show you the final manuscript results, because this is something we're still planning, uh, we're still thinking about the improvements uh, we can make there. Uh, just to show you guys what an example of that would look like. This is an example from before we actually uh, st started working on making them more human readable. So this is, but as you can see, it's still actually quite clear what's going on there. Um, yeah, so that's what we do. I am, in general, interested to hear what you guys do on your projects. I see Nick frowning because, no? <laughs> okay, um, but I am actually interested to hear what you guys do. We are out of time, and we're assuming you guys are hungry enough to run away. Yeah? Okay. So find me later and do you have time for a question? One question? No? Okay. No questions guys. Not today. Um, but if you want to talk about it, come join me in the lunch, I would say. Okay. Thank you.